Hello and welcome everyone to this very special event of our Center for Russian Studies named after Vladimir Vysotsky. I'm the Center's founding director, Olga Tabachnikova, as it, as it says on our website at the University of Central Lancashire. Vysotsky's art served as a breath of fresh air in the totalitarian state stifled by the ideological control and hypocrisy, and his art helped Russian people to sustain their human dignity and cultural distinctiveness. Vladimir Vysotsky, a poet, bard, and actor, was one of those artistic personalities who become a living conscience of the entire nation. And I personally grew up with his songs all around me, and um, the window in our flat was one of the millions of those windows from which his recorded voice could be heard all over the country. Uh, and for me, like for so many of my compatriots, Vladimir Vysotsky is a national treasure and spiritual sanctity, a man whose role in Russian culture is difficult to overestimate. Our center's mission is to bring Russian culture to a Western audience, and there is, to my mind, no better way than to do so through Vysotsky's songs that embody, if you like, the essential traits of Russianness. Um, last year, I interviewed Vysotsky's son, Nikita, the director of the Moscow Museum dedicated to his father's legacy, and this interview will soon appear on our channel once we've finished equipping it with English subtitles. And there are other steps that we plan to take to bring Vladimir Vysotsky to the English-speaking world. And it's fantastic that our dear guests of today are actually doing the same thing. So I'm delighted to introduce to you John Fardnan, the translator, and Anthony Cable, the performer. John is a widely published award-winning author of books about science and nature, a poet, and a songwriter himself, and an acclaimed translator mm -hmm. of Russian and Central Asian literature. He translated the poetry for Hamid Ismailov's The Devil's Dance, which won the European Bank RD Literary Prize 2019. And he was a finalist for US Pen Translation Award in 2020, with his translation of Kazakh writer Roland Sisinbayev's The Dead Wonder in the Desert. He has now made the first major translation of Vladimir Vysotsky's songs into English, published by Glagoslav. Anthony Cable uh, is one of the UK's leading stage singers. His career straddles both opera and West End shows. He has performed at the National Theatre and the London Palladium and has given recitals and concerts in Germany, Russia and France. He created and performed the show Jack Braille, The Rage to Live, which received great critical acclaim in the UK, France and Germany. And he's also a prize winning short story writer and poet. And this is especially nice because my colleague uh, present here, Elena Artamonova, is also a musician. So our center essentially combines literature, more specifically poetry with music and so does the event of today. Um, so please welcome John Farden and Anthony Cable at our Vysotsky Center with their performance of Vysotsky in English. Now, before we start at John's request, we will listen to one of the Vysotsky's songs. <coughs> Фатального исхода от жизни никогда не устаю. Я не люблю любое время года, когда веселых песен не пою. Я не люблю холодного цинизма, восторженность не верю. И еще, когда чужой мои читает письма, заглядывая мне через плечо, я не люблю. Когда наполовину или когда прервали разговор, я не люблю, когда стреляют в спину, я также против выстрелов в упор, я ненавижу сплетни в виде версии, червей сомнения, почести и иглу, или когда все время против шерсти, или когда с железом по стеклу. Уверенность не сытой, уж лучше пусть откажут тормоза. Досадно мне, коль слово честь забыто, и коль в чести наветы на глаза. Когда я вижу сломанные открытия, нет жалости во мне и неспроста. Я не люблю насилие и бессилие, вот только жаль распятого Христа. Я не люблю себя. Когда я трушу, досадно мне, когда невинных бьют. Я не люблю, когда мне лезут в душу, тем более, когда в нее плюют. Я не люблю манежи и арены, 
На них миллион меняют по рублю. Пусть впереди большие перемены. Я это никогда не полюблю. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon. Um, yes, that of course was the amazing Vladimir Vysotsky, and yes, you saw the, the the subtitles were in German, but the song is a very famous one of his called "I Don't Like," which lists all the things that um, the author of the song, which is not necessarily Vysotsky as in his own self, doesn't like, and it's a man with principles and. Um, who does, doesn't suffer fools gladly. So, yes, um, one of the things about Vysotsky was one of the most, most amazing artists in the last hundred years. And he died 41 years ago at the age of just 42. Um, and I'm here to talk about my encounter with him. I think about Vysotsky's distinctive voice, his powerfully emotional approach and his remarkable command of the Russian language made him not only a household name in the Soviet Union, in the 1970s, but earned him the adulation of ordinary people and intellectuals alike. When he died in 1980, many letters paid tribute um, were written to the Taganka Theatre where he was working at the time and reprising his celebrated role as Hamlet. One of these letters expresses perfectly on the one hand the feelings of so many ordinary Soviet people. This is how it goes. We often hear that we are worth nothing, that we have no freedom and that our stores are empty. All of that is true. But when you hear it over and over again, you're caught by despair. God, what kind of nation are we? And then it comes to us. We have Vysotsky. So, and at the other end of the scale, the most favorite, famous Soviet poet of the time, Yevgeny Yevtushenko, was in awe of him. After hearing Vysotsky's song, The Wolf Hunt, Yevtushenko sent him a telegram saying, heard your song 20 times running. I bow down before you. And Yevtushenko was not alone. The Wolf Hunt was perhaps his most famous song, the one best loved by, by his mother, as well as Yevtushenko. It's the story of a wolf hunt. Um, told from the wolf's point of view. It's just four minutes long, but Vysotsky's unforgettable guttural delivery and driving tempo turned it into a dramatic and unforgettable epic. On the one hand, it's just the imagined story of a hunted animal, but people could not help seeing it as a metaphor for the way the Soviet authorities treated their own citizens. Some saw it as about the Siberian camps, written about so notoriously at the time by Solzhenitsyn. When prisoners tried to escape, they were hunted down like wolves and forced to stay in the boundaries established by the walls, decorated with the red flags of the prison camps, just like the hunters drive the walls within the lines of red flags. Others saw it as a picture of the whole Soviet Union in which everyone felt like a haunted, hunted wolf. These are the opening lines of the song, sung by the wolf. I'm straining every last sinew, but today is just like yesterday. Got me cornered, got me in view, and they'll joyfully chase down their prey. These lines must have resonated powerfully with those trapped by everyday lives and the pressure of the Soviet authorities. And maybe they'll resonate with many people in the English world today who likewise feel hunted. What's extraordinary and what's perhaps gave Vysotsky such appeal was that his wolf hunt, while vividly exposing the brutality of the hunters, is also an uplifting message of defiance. Yes, the wolf may be hunted down, but we all live to fight another day. Near the end, the wolf makes a bid for freedom, saying, but I will break the red flag line. The thirst for life is stronger in me. And I hear with glee from far behind the startled cries following me. When you hear that, you begin to understand the impulse behind that letter I quoted earlier, which is worth quoting again. We often hear that we are worth nothing, that we have no freedom and that our stores are empty. All of that is true. But when you hear it over and over again, you're caught by despair. God, what kind of nation are we? 
and then it come to us. We have Vysotsky. No wonder people loved him. Vysotsky helped inspire anew the thirst for life. Surely a message that resonates everywhere today. Most Russian people will probably know this song, but let's listen to it again in English. But before we do, let me explain the reason I'm talking to you today, as Olga said, is because in collaboration with Olga Naxton, I've translated a collection of Vysotsky's lyrics and poems into English to be published um, port soon by Gleguslav. They're songs meant to be performed, of course, not just read on the page. So I've been collaborating with Sir singer Anthony Cable to try and introduce Vysotsky's work to English speaking word authors, audiences. And during the course of this talk, Anthony will perform some of, her, some of our translations for you, starting with the Wolfgang. Now, Vysotsky had a unique performance style, which is impossible to emulate, even for Russians. And Vysotsky himself was adamant that if anyone sings his song, they should never attempt to imitate him, but to make their song their own. And that's what Anthony has done, I hope. So this is very much our English version of the Wolf Funk, but we hope it captures at least some of the spirit of Vysotsky. So let me introduce Anthony Cable. The Wolf Hunt. I am straining with every last sinew, but today is just like yesterday. Got me cornered, got me in view, and the joyfully hunt down their prey. From the fir trees, the shots are bursting, from the hunter's guns hid in the shade. On the cold white snow, the wolves are tumbling, the living targets are shooting a cage. The wolf hunt has begun, it's getting closer, veterans and cubs. Come on, wolves, let's go. The dogs bark till they're sick. The beaters loudly cry. Lights of red flags of blood from the snow. It's as equals, hunters and wolves begin. But the hunters' hands will not shake. The line of red flags has blocked us in. So they beat loudly, make no mistake. There are customs wolves cannot break. The lessons learned as cubs, our lives define. With every drop of mother's milk we take, we suck the rule, don't cross the red line. The wolf and has begun, it's getting closer. Veterans and cubs, come on wolves, let's go. The dogs bark till they're sick, the beaters loudly cry. Lines of red flags of blood upon the snow. Our legs are fast, our jaws are strong. Why lead to tell us why we call? Why do they pursue us with shot so long when we aren't breaking any laws at all? But a wolf's no choice, this is our lot. And now my life will end the same. And now the one I am intended for lifts his gun and smiles and takes aim. The wolf and has begun, it's getting closer, veterans and cubs. Come on, wolves, let's go. The dogs bark till they're sick. The beaters loudly cry. Lines of red flags of blood upon the snow. But I will break the red flag vine. The thirst for life is stronger in me. And now I hear from far behind the hunter's cries following me. And I am straining on every sinew. But today is not like yesterday. Got me cornered, got me in view. But this time the hunters lost their prey. The whole hunt has begun. It's getting closer. Veterans and cubs, come on, wolves, let's go. The dogs bark till they're sick. The beaters loudly cry. Lines of red flags of blood upon the snow. Bravo. Anthony, thank you. A thank you. Later. Okay, well, that was the wolf hunt. So, when talking about Vysotsky to Western audience, there is the temptation to try and compare him with Western musicians. In the English speaking world, people sometimes talk of Vysotsky as the Russian Bob Dylan. But for me, this doesn't really convey how much he was loved and revered across the Soviet Union or 
the broadness of his appeal. The Dylan comparison is an attempt to capture the stature and quality of his lyrics. Um, certainly there's no other artist from the English speaking world with a comparable canon of lyrics. But Vysotsky was a very different kind of artist. Despite his songs about truck drivers and coal miners, Dylan was, even in his heyday, niche, um, appealing to the middle class, the intellectuals, the folkies. His best-selling album, Blood on the Tracks, sold just over two million copies. But Vysotsky's appeal was almost universal, and he had hundreds of millions of fans across the Soviet Union. He touched the heart and soul of ordinary Soviet citizens, not just Russians, but Bulgarians and Ukrainians, Armenians and Estonians, in a way that it's hard for us to comprehend in the West. This is something I'll come back to later. A few people really, really hated him, of course, but most loved him as one of their own. I mentioned Dylan's album earlier, Dylan's album sales uh, as a measure of Dylan's success. And yet, remarkably, very few of Vysotsky's hundreds of songs were officially recorded. Vysotsky made just one official record early in his career, the songs he wrote for the film The Vertical, which were about mountain climbing. The Soviet authorities would not let him make another. And yet he continued to write for films, but few people got to see these. A few recordings were also made on the ribs, that is by etching the soundtrack on x-rays <laughs> and on the ribs, of course, referring to because the motion of were chest x-rays. But most of his recordings were bootlegs. They're magnetic as that. Um, tape recordings made at live performance and then passed on by copying on reel to reel recorders from friend to friend. The fact that they were rough recordings in the first place and got scratchier and scratchier with each duplication somehow added to the mystique and combined with the feeling of contraband, forbidden treasure, uh, and built the sense that Vysotsky was one of the people. In Soviet cities of the time, as Olga mentioned earlier, summer evenings were often filled with the crackly sound of the latest Vysotsky recordings filtering through an open window. It was an act of sharing. People deliberately opened the windows and pumped up the volume so that all might hear adding to the camaraderie. This is how Vysotsky was heard. His songs were almost never heard on TV or radio. And yet, despite this restriction, his following was massive. The, the state never arranged live concerts for him as they would other more acceptable artists. And yet he played for huge audience throughout his careers. Basically, he had to trick the bureaucrat staying one step ahead. The, the, the idea was to avoid big cities where the authorities would ban him at once and stick to middle-sized towns. He'd show up with little or no notice before the local Soviets could get their act together and stop him and play as many shows as he could in a few days, knowing that um, eventually he, this would be the last, uh, the last and only time he'd be allowed to play there since the authorities would then have got their act together and got a ban in place. So those treasured concerts would be packed to the rafters. Often he'd do four or five shows a day, being on stage and punishing nine or 10 hours in that time or more. So local or youth clubs were given the nod and organized it quickly, all in secret. Then on the day of his arrival, they'd spread the word and news spread like wildfire. Leonardiv des uh, describes how when Vysotsky went to play in the town of Tubyshev, a great crowd came to meet him off the train, including many old women, mothers, wives of soldiers killed in the war, who Vysotsky seemed to sing for. The next day, he played three concerts at the Sports Palace, each instantly sold out with 6,000 in each, and the huge crowds outside smashed windows and demanded that speakers relay the event to the neighborhood. To the Western mind, this sounds something almost like Beatlemania. But this was in strictly controlled Soviet Russia. And the fans were not wild teenagers, but across the generations and across the social spectrum. Vysotsky 
had a remarkable ability to give voice to ordinary people. He very rarely wrote songs about himself or his own feelings, like most Western singer-songwriters. Instead, actor that he was, he inhabited a character, not a celebrity or a conventional hero, but an outsider, a troubled character, an ordinary guy hitting hard times. And he did it with such conviction that his listeners were convinced he must have been one, a soldier in the war, an alpinist, a low life, or even an inmate of the prison camps. So let's pause for a moment, let Anthony play another of his songs. This one is City Romance, um, and it is one of these characters again, a small, small time criminal who briefly believes that he has found his piece of heaven on earth. So Anthony. City Romance. Strolling the streets of the city, I by chance beat up two passers-by. But when the cops came to arrest me at the station, I saw her and died. Well, I'd no idea why she came there. She was getting a pass checked, I guess. She was young, she was lovely with blonde hair. I decided to find her, oh yes. Well, I followed this girl to her door, see, but I'm a thug, so what could I say? Had a drink, then asked out this sweetie to a nearby railway cafe. But everyone there kept on staring, I just screamed with rage inwardly. I almost slapped a guy just for daring to wink at her casually. But I ordered her rolls with good caviar. I let my cash flow like a stream. Sent requests for love songs on the guitar and asked for cranes to finish our dream. I kept up my promises till sunrise, swore them over and over again. I swore to the darling of my eyes. I'd been clean over five days by then. I told her my whole life was lost, see, blew my nose, sobbed in my sleeve. She said, pay the price, you can have me. It's okay with me, I believe. Well, I lashed out at this blonde beauty as the blood boiled up deep inside. I knew why she was with the police, see, that girl I loved once had just died. Thank you, Anthony. You all have so, saw the um, twist at the end, which is a typical dramatic twist of, of this art scheme. So particular thing seems crop up again and again, his songs, and people often divide them into types like, like his outlaw songs, his war song and his street song and his mountain songs. And it was for some almost like an encyclopedia of Soviet life. A key feature of Vysotsky's work is his extraordinary growl of a voice. He never sounded like the beautiful tenors espoused by the authorities, never one of the comfortable leap, but a man ravaged by street life, wrecked in the trenches, rubbed raw by life. Indeed, his voice was always harsh and he, he almost never made it into acting school but he worked on it strenuously and turned it into his greatest asset, a unique, hoarse and intense roar that sounded like the very embodiment of Russian fashion. But it was never intuate rage. Every one of his songs was delivered with very precise articulation and humor. None of this was accidental, but a powerful artistic choice. He wrote songs in, in the genre of the author song, which is a very distinctive feature of post-war Russian. Generally speaking, Vysotsky explained in an interview, they're not songs, but poems on a rhythmical base. 
he accompanied them on guitar alone because of its simplicity. All the songs give me a chance to tell you what worries me, what is of concern to me, that sort of thing, he said. But that modest explanation belies the extraordinary power of his storytelling, his complex use of alliteration, assonance, internal rhyme, and of course, the unforgettable gravelly voice, which can switch from an intimate whisper to an epic crescendo in moments. He explained in the same interview how author songwriters are criticized for their simple, primitive melodies. But his answer was this, I believe that nothing should interfere with the perception of the text, the meaning. I wanted the songs to enter not only the ears, but the souls right from the beginning. He wrote in clever rhyme too, because he realized that this had a dynamic and powerful and immediate effect on the audience. This is why, of course, his work creates such extraordinary challenges for the translator. To translate Rysotsky's lyrics, one not only has to translate the meaning, but to capture this verbal the gymnastics and also the voice of the character who sings the song. And it goes without saying that it must rhyme and match the rhythm and melody perfectly too. To show you what I mean, Anthony is going to play my English version of a lesser known song, which is called, which I've called Smithereen. Smithereens is a real firecracker of a song. And the legendary theatre director, Yuri Lubimov, who directed Vysotsky in many productions at the extraordinary Taganka Theatre, said, Vysotsky sang about everything that people think about when they're at home, but are still afraid to talk about. And that's why we all had tapes of his song. And this song seems to be one of those and has maybe just as much resonance right now. So, Anthony, this time you're on. <laughs> right. Uh, let's go. Smithereens. The crown has smashed the smithereens, not thrown the ruler to be seen. Russia's life and loss has been shut to hell. And we Forced into holes in the ground like poor thieves, we are bound. Blood and shame are mixed and found just as well. Yes, we. We have no bloody clue who to join and who to screw. Who is in our bastard crew? Where to go and what to do? This all sucks. There's no spirit, no honor, no shame. Who's one of us and one of them? How was it that this mess came? And does no one give a damn? Russia's fucked. Shame on all those peace-loving shits, on those who just can't come at those who can't choose if it's meant to kill. Look out! Let the wolf, let the bear, let the hawk's talons tear, just invite the crows from there for a fill. And you, where's your old firmness, where's your old confidence? All you've got is meanness and a pistol in your hand. It's gone, damn it, it's gone. It's all battered and shattered. There's only one thing matters. Put your gun up to your brow and shoot your enemy now. Thank you, Anthony. Okay, so now I'd just like to talk a, a little bit more about the issue of translation, or rather non-translation. Because what I find odd is that this Russian superstar is so little known in the West. Uh, you know, this, this was a man who was voted um, in a, not, a poll not so long ago as the second most important cultural figure in Russia um, in the last, 20, uh, last century, um, only behind Yuri Gagarin, the astronaut, the cosmonaut. So it still seems remarkable to see that the work of such a towering poet songwriter and cultural icon has not until now been properly translated into English beyond the many scattered attempts online by Russian fans. So this forthcoming book of my translation published by Glagoslav is the first proper collection of his lyrics in English, more than 40 years after his death. A New York Times article published a year after his death attempted to explain why it was like this. They said, because his ballots 
ballads rarely dealt explicitly with politics because the street language he used with such effect is almost untranslatable. And because the life he sang about is so alien to the West. Now, this to me seems barely an adequate explanation. Countless Russian poets and authors have been translated into English. So why has Vysotsky been overlooked? To be honest, I don't know. And I might hazard a few guesses. First, that maybe Vysotsky is regarded by the translation establishment as a popular songwriter and therefore not a serious artist worth the effort of translating. Certainly there have been critics in Russia who have said he is only a mediocre poet who simply managed to touch a nerve with ordinary people. And yet Russia's leading poets, not only Yevtushenko, but Brodsky and Akhmatova have acclaimed his skill and some people put him in the panoply of great Russian poets. And even if we were to suppose hypothetically that he is a lightweight poet, he is still a figure of such stature that his work must be of huge interest. And many lightweight poets and authors have been translated. So I come to a second reason. It is, is it that his work is just totally untranslatable as the New York Times piece said? Well, that was actually one reason why I embarked on this project to find out if this is really true. And yes, translating Pisotsky's lyric has been the most challenging translation task I've under ever undertaken. And I might express my deep thanks to Olga Naxton, who has been my co-translator, providing me literal translations of all the songs. Yeah, I've translated Pushkin and Lermontov, Abai and Pessoa, and each presents unique challenges. But yes, re recreating Pisotsky's work in, in English was the biggest challenge of all. First of all, it's crucial that my English words are lyrics, not poetry. They are there for English people to sing, not simply to read on the page, and for readers to read as they listen to Vysotsky himself singing. So the English words must match the melody and rhythm, pacing and intonation with a kind of precision that is almost never demanded in translating written poetry. And this is one reason why I've worked with Anthony, um, who has shown that I cannot afford even the slightest looseness since it makes the words unsingable. I'm lucky to be a, lucky enough to be a songwriter myself as well as a poet and translator. So I know lyrics need to work with the melody, how the melody often dictates the flow of words and vice versa. Moreover, the rhythms in songs are very different from the rhythms in poetry, and that presents an entirely new challenge for the translator. Secondly, Vysotsky is, and I think most Russian people would agree, an absolute master of Russian language. His lyrics are dense and in ling linguistically inventive in a way that very few Russian poets can actually match. He uses consonants, for instance, you know, brilliant staccato volley of words, which combined with his unique voice and delivery, create an extraordinary energy that is genuinely thrilling for Russian listeners. So the sound of English language is very different and it's almost impossible to recreate these verbal fireworks exactly. So that's why I've had to work um, hard to find equivalent effects in English. Thirdly, many of the characters and situations of Vysotsky's songs are uh, instantly identifiable to people in the Soviet Union at the time, but entirely in, alien to English readers. And they're often speaking not in pure academic Russian, which translators know, but in street slang. So bridging the gap is a real challenge. But Vysotsky was a man of theatre and his characters have distinctive voices. So it seemed to me that the way to transfer these characters into English was to give them a voice that would help English people identify. So I want to give you an example of this. One of the hardest of all songs to translate was his monumental song about guns. It's a peon to guns of a small time criminal um, and the sense of empowerment that guns give him. It's an extraordinary piece of work, a five minute drama that packs a powerful punch as much as a full length play. It was written half a century ago in Russia, but my goodness, how relevant it seems now. So my task as a translator was to give character to a distinctive voice and to preserve the mesmerizing driving rhythm 
which is the key to the poem's effects. I'd love to give you all the song, but it's long. So I'll just give you a short extract to give you some idea. And I certainly won't even attempt to sing it. So here it is, it's a song about guns. The little guys swarm around the world. They've got their time on loan. There are good guys, there are bad guys, some in gangs and some alone. I know a few of the good ones. I see their wings in my head, but I'm friends too with some bad ones. <coughs> and they all want guns. They want guns. They want guns and bloodshed. The Mr. Biggs, rich as creators, they see the missile chance, but the little guys, what can they do? They just need firearms. Look at that deadbeat loser. Not a ruble in his pocket, but what's in there? Look closer. A gun, he's gonna cock it. He's been dreaming about supper since he missed it last night. His shoes are on their uppers. Taddy jacket, far too tight. I'd walk with him along the way through the evening lightly, but my sweaty fingers always stay on the figure tightly, on the trigger tightly. I'm purposeful. I'm on business. A little hammered, slightly stoned, slightly pissed. Hey, what you looking at me for? It's not like I'm a cripple. I can pass for a human being if I have a decent tipple. OK, right. You odd ones. A little chat now. Come along. And then we've dined and had some fun. I'll sing to you about guns, about guns, about guns, a song. Mr. Big may look like a little guy as he lays out card by card, but it's the biggest steps he plays for. He plays high and he plays hard. He likes to set off a bomb or two, but that's not for the likes of us. We're a much more humble crew. Just a handgun and no fuss. The gun I bought's in my pocket here, primed and at the ready. It's all I need to stop the fear. A stiletto, sharp and deadly. The normal folk are scurrying by, desperate not to me, but we're tooled up to terrify as we stride out down the street. The barrel searches faces like a tease. You there, hands on the wall, just freeze. You're wasting your times with chemicals. That's a futile plan. But if you get yourself an axe boy, then you'll be a man. Now, uh, my story has begun. The unvarnished truth and strong. I'll sing it as well as anyone. I'll sing to you about guns, about guns, a song. And that's just the half of the poem. It's the heartrending story of the world's criminal underclass in one five minutes strong, and it's quite astonishing. Of course, the translation wasn't about just about words. And Adam Anthony is going to tell you a little bit about why making the music working was a challenge too. So, Anthony, please. Yeah, right. Hello, everybody. Right, talk a little bit. <laughs> okay. I think the first thing, I just want to consult my own notes here, but I think the first thing is to talk about Vaughan Williams, Rafe Vaughan Williams, <laughs> who said essentially that once you set words to music, you enter the realm of music and the words have their own music. And that music inevitably changes in translation. So we're making, so our tonal palette in English, is different from that in Russian, and we have to make do with it. Now, next thing is, now he played, as John mentioned, on a seven string guitar, tuned usually to an open G, and then he'd take the whole thing down a tone to tone it to an open F chord. Now, what that means is that inevitably, uh, you're gonna have intonation problems, and the guitar would be a bit out of tune. But that didn't worry Vladimir Vysotsky very much because it was the words that were most important. Now, uh, the chord, uh, yes, the chordal palette he used was about four, half a dozen chords at most. A minor, G minor, E, E minor, B7 and C are the chords I've been working with. Also, he often changes from major to minor uh, to heighten tension. Just to illustrate that, if we look at um, look back at smithereens, and then get 
and you sing and tell it hold the same note but you raise your third by a semitone and then you've got a whole different color in the chord even though one the smallest possible change and he uses that a lot now the other problem oh yes yeah now when uh john asked me to start looking at this music the first thing i had to do was work out what the tunes were and with vladimir vysotsky's voice it's not always very easy so i had a whole set of decisions to make um and sometimes they had to be a bit um taken in a slightly executive manner let's say but i was as faithful as i could possibly be however i did see that vysotsky very often changed the melody from one verse to the next he didn't these melodies they're not set in stone it serves the language and that's the important thing the language and the words and the text itself <laughs> the other thing that i found is he has this flexible attitude if you look at his song um he hasn't come back from the fight which we'll be doing fully later on um i the version i used to learn it was in two in a bar how does it seem wrong things are all still the same Whereas I just recently discovered, why does it seem wrong? Things are all still the same. So it's whatever serves him. And I suspect very often that he could change <laughs> from day to day or, or from show to show. Um, and I think that's about all I have to say about the subject. Um, oh, yeah. The only thing is, oh yeah, one little thing, it's worth saying that he uses a lot. Uh, he finishes often, very often on a sixth chord. That's an A minor, and there's the sixth added, which gives a very, and you're gonna see this in the next song at the very end, it gives a very wistful, slightly sad effect. So let's, just to illustrate that, Let's go to the next song, which is going to be <laughs> just one, sorry, just one second. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I've got I've got another song in my head now, and this one won't, uh, won't go. To the cold. To the cold. That's it. Right. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. And again, this time. From where we know best When those foreign cities gain a hold Could be Minsk, could be Brest To the cold, to the cold Not for nothing at all We leave our poplar trees when we just hear these hard cities call as if there's more there to please not for nothing at all though we're warm here at home we can never find rest for new thrills and new friends we still roam as if we're in distress, as if it's warmer than home. And of course we will share good times when we are far. 
but we'll always come home i swear where then is our true star maybe here maybe there but we'll always come home i swear maybe here maybe there And that was the added six. OK, I carry straight on. I can't remember what's next on the list now. Uh, I can't read my own writing. It hasn't, hasn't come back from the fly. <laughs> Thank you, John. Right. Uh, <clears throat> oh, yes. Now, this was the one I was just discussing earlier on. Again, I've heard it in uh, two in a bar and I've heard it in three in a bar. <laughs> This is two to ball. Why does it seem wrong? Things are all still the same. Yes, the sky is still as blue and as bright. The trees are the same. The breeze and water the same. But he hasn't come back from the fight. Yes, the trees are the same. The breeze and water the same. But he hasn't come back from the fight. I just don't now recall who was wrong, who was right in those rows that went on through the night. But I just miss him now, now that he's not in sight. He hasn't come back from the fight. Yes, I just miss him now, now that he's not in sight. He hasn't come back from the fight. Sometimes he'd sing out a tune, sometimes not a peep, and sometimes it was just hollow prattle. He would not let me sleep, always a dawn day to keep. He hasn't come back from the battle. He would not let me sleep, always a dawn day to keep. He hasn't come back from the battle. Now there's nothing at all, no more words that I know. We were two then before, yes, that's right. The trees are to blame, we've lost our campfire's flame. He hasn't come back from the fight. The breeze is to blame, we've lost our campfire's flame. He hasn't come back from the fight. Now they burst out like a captive from jail. Yes, those words that escaped in the night. Hey, mate, roll me a smoke. But silence prevails. He hasn't come back from the fight. Hey, mate, throw me a smoke. Silence prevails. He hasn't come back from the fight. Though the fallen have gone, there are true sentries. They won't leave us alone in our pain. The sky shines off the trees like it shines off the seas, turning the forest deep blue again. The sky shines off the trees like it shines off the seas, turning the forest deep blue again. In that dark, narrow trench, there was space for us to there was space, but time to take flight. I'm alone here, it's true, but it seems that it's me and not you who didn't come back from the fight. I'm alone here, it's true, but it seems that it's me and not you who didn't come back from the fight. Thank you, Anthony. OK, I'd just like to talk briefly about Vysotsky's hand at the beginning. Sorry. 
He played many starring roles at the Gang. It was the Hamlet, which really stuck in the mind. He played the role over 200 times and he was reprising it when he died. Vysotsky played it in a black sweater and jeans, very much as a man of the people, not a high prince. And Vysotsky has played his take on Hamlet like this. The Hamlets that I had seen kept searching during the whole of the play for proof of Claudius's guilt in order to kill him and to justify himself, to justify his revenge. On the contrary, I kept looking for proof of the king's innocence. I do everything for blood not to be shed. In other words, he turned Hamlet from a frail vacillator into a man of strong principles caught in an impossible situation. And this is a character he made his own in so many of his songs. It is this sense of high morals, the strength and the pain it brings that suffuses his work and give him so much appeal. He was, in a way, um, I think as Olga mentioned earlier, he was Russia's conscience. The translation of the play Hamlet was Pasternak's and the show opened with Vysotsky sitting back to the audience with guitar in hand singing Pasternak's poem about Hamlet. The image was so striking that Vysotsky himself was sometimes referred to as Hamlet with a guitar. But Vysotsky wrote his own poem about Hamlet, which I have translated as well. And I won't recite this for myself, but I'll play you a little to, of Vysotsky reciting his own poem in Russian to give you a feel of just what an extraordinary performer he is. Um, so yes, can we have the second link now? I don't want to play the whole, whole song because it's very, the whole poem, but if we can play the first minute of this track, um, that would be fantastic. Я только малость объясню в стихе. На все я не имею полномочий. Я был зачат как нужно во грехе. В поту и в нервах первой брачной ночи. Я знал, что отрываясь от земли, Чем выше мы, тем жестче и сурой. Я шел спокойно прямо в короли И вел себя наследным принцем крови. Я знал, все будет так, как я хочу. Я не бывал в накладе и в уроне. Мои друзья по школе и мечу Служили мне, как их отцы и король. Не думал я над тем, что говорю, и с легкостью слова бросал на ветер. Мне верили и так, как говорю, все высокопоставленные дети пугались нас, ночные сторожа. Как поспою болело время нами, я спал на кожах, мясо ел с ножа, и злую лошадь мучил с тременами. Я знал, мне будет... Thank you. Sorry to interrupt that, but you can come back to it and listen to yourself in full later. So I just want to say, wrap up by saying, <clears throat> when Vysotsky died tragically young at just 42 in 1980, he was mourned by tens of millions of people. It was the time of the Moscow Olympics and the KGB were anxious to keep this uncomfortable voice out of the news. Even so, over 30,000, some people say over a million, gathered in Moscow to pay a tribute despite a KGB ban. Volodya was for them the voice of truth. You understand what our lives are like. Work, work, hellish work and nothing else, wrote one mourner, while another said, we're here because he said the truth, not the half truth we hear all the time. He wrote about our life. There's a website called Please Kill Me, which sums up, up his impact like this said, Vladimir Vysotsky, 1938 to 1980, was the Soviet Union's Renaissance man, poet, songwriter, novelist, screenwriter, singer, musician, stage actor, movie star, alcoholic, drug addict, and philanderer. Yet for all his accomplishments and all his flaws, he was effectively treated as a non-person in his own country. From the authorities point of view, he was too dangerous to honor and too popular to exile. So they pretty much ignored him and hoped his behavior wouldn't embarrass them too much. But the last laugh is on him. His impact has been lasting. I have a cleaner from Bulgaria, her name is Zivka Haristova, who must have been an infant when 
Vysotsky died, when she saw a book of Vysotsky's song on my table, she at once burst into tears and her sister Lydia wrote this note to me expl to explain why. They say Jesus spoke in parables to his contemporaries. For the people of my generation, Vysotsky was like him. He taught us his song. Whatever happened, we said, on this occasion, in one of his songs, Vysotsky says the following. He was our banner in those times. Just a week before he died, Vysotsky wrote an incredibly poignant poem called Ice Above and Ice Below to his French wife, Marina Vladi, and he was separated from her, her at the time by visa restrictions and maybe by the KBG, KGB. And this last verse is a fitting epitaph to him. I'm under half a century, barely 40. I'm kept alive by God and by you, but I will sing when I stand before the Almighty and I'll have my song to see me through. Vysotsky could write the tenderest, most intimate love song, and yet he will be remembered most for his songs about, as he put it, men who look death in the face, men in extreme situation. And nowhere is this better illustrated than in one of his most famous songs, Stubborn Horses, which opens with the lines, along the edge of a rocky ledge, a steep precipice on Hell's Abyss. So in the film, White Nights, um, the ballet star, Michael, Mikhail Baryshnikov, famously dances to this song with wild abandon to explain why his character, Kolya, left the Soviet Union to be free to dance the way Vysotsky sang. Kolya proclaims, I want to scream like he does. So, here is Anthony to scream for you. Right. And I, I do read this as a, as a song about um, his struggles with addiction and alcoholism. Uh, Stubborn Horses. <laughs> Along the edge of a precipice the rocky edge of hell's abyss I drag my horses through the mist The whip sings its vicious stinging hiss This thin air makes me dizzy I gulp the wind, I drink the mist Now I feel the deadly bliss I'm lost in this, I'm lost in this Take it easy now, your horses Take it easy, will you now? Take no notice of the hissing whiplash sting. For these stubborn horses will take me, they will take me to the brow. And I've no time to live on, and no time to sing. I will make the horses drink. I will sing the final song. I will make this moment last long as I stand here on the brink. I will vanish like a ball of fluff blown off your hand by a storm. And they will drag me quickly away on a sleigh Through the snowy dawn Slow down a little, your horses Slacken off your pace Give me a little time Until my resting place Take it easy now, your horses Take it easy, will you now Take no notice of the hissing whiplash sting for oh, these stubborn horses will take me, they will take me to the brow. And I have no time to live on and no time to sing. I will make the horses drink, I will sing the final song. I will make the moment last long as I stand here on the bridge. Here, right on time, but you can't be late for God, of course. But why, why are the angels singing with such angry force? Or is it the 
sleigh bells sobbing, sobbing on the horse's door. Is it just me yelling, slow down to the horses? Take it easy now, you horses. Take it easy, will you now? Take no notice of the hissing whiplash sting. For these stubborn horses will take me, they will take me to the brow. And I have no time to live on and no time to sing. I will make the horses drink, I will sing the final song. I will make the moment last as I stand here on the brink. Bravo. Thank you, Anthony, and thank you, Vladimir Vysotsky, and thank you, everybody, for listening, and thank you, Olga. Thank you very, very much. I must say, before I open the floor to questions, I must say that I'm very, very touched and very moved, because, um, like with anything sacred, that um, it is so culturally dependent, uh, it's not without trepidation that you um, are obviously welcome, but still carefully watch people from other cultures uh, trying to convey that and translate it uh, by, by their own means and um, invest with their own interpretation. But so so I was I didn't know what to expect, to be honest. But as I said, I am very moved by the sheer love uh, that that you um, displayed here uh, with all your work, with the performance. And um, and I didn't hear the, you know, any false note. Uh, in a broad sense. So uh, thank you so, so much. And also I wanted to say that uh, it was a very nice, so I mean any song would be nice to finish uh, off with, but this is a particularly nice ending. Uh, and I take it like lots and lots of his songs, and that's why it's high art really, it's masterpieces, because you can take it in any way you like, they're multi-layered. And this one in particular is about life struggling against death. It's about this perpetual fight that uh, that is called life, that we are all undergoing, and especially when um, it's so intense, the way that he lived his life. At the age of 42, when he died, he he had like many, many lives that he had lived. And um, and so it's, um, it's that intensity and it's that resistance and resilience and, uh, and being absolutely genuine, absolutely authentic, that is clearly now, I can see, that it transcends borders, it transcends cultures, and it's uh, common to all humans, especially now that, as we live, we are um, being deprived of more and more things that actually matter to a human being. And so, and Vysotsky is, and this song is, uh, kind of epitomizes everything that uh, that is real, that is existentially important and invaluable. Um, and it's crucial for for everyone. So um, and it's it's really resistance of life in in the face of of death. And uh, one little remark uh, about the, all these smug, uh, arrogant claims that he wasn't a real poet. Um, he entered Russian language. Russian language is it's like Pushkin who transformed Russian language. Russian language is unimaginable without him. And now you know several generations after. Um, youth, they use his expressions, they use his words without knowing, without necessarily knowing the origin. So he became part of the Russian language. Proverbs, you know, uh, cutting from his songs are used as proverbs, as idioms. Um, and this is, and he, he realized this when he was alive. Of course, he realized his genius, but uh, he knew that he's entering the language. And, and that, as he said himself, is the highest possible praise that any poet can dream about. So, and this has come true. So now Russian language is uh, is full of quotes from Vysotsky and people just say it. Um, and I, I, I watch people, you know, in Russia, <coughs> different genres, and I'm always struck, I'm always amazed how <coughs> um, across social stratum, uh, social strata, you hear Vysotsky quoted, sometimes with reference, sometimes, most times without. So thank you so, so much. Uh, it's been great, absolutely great, and um, uh, and now I would like uh, to invite our audience to ask questions. 
And also, sorry, before um, this is a university thing, before you go, uh, Jake will now, while we have this Q&A session, Jake will now put in the chat um, the link to a little questionnaire. So uh, I would be very grateful if you fill that questionnaire and send the results by email. Yeah, is that how it works, Jake? You can send them. Um, just need to fill it out online and it gets automatically sent to us, so it's fine. Okay, so you don't even have to send an email. You just um, follow the link and um, fill uh, fill that form with your answers, and it's very very brief. So um, yeah, would be grateful if you okay, do that. No problem at all. Yeah. So uh, any questions to our wonderful speakers? Yes, it is a question. If you allow me. Yeah, please. Hello. Uh, uh, thank you very much. It was great and it was very different. I know the Sotsky very good. And as I told you, John, I, I, I was at least 100 times uh, at, at his place and I've seen Gamlet at least 20 times. And I was working in Taganka as a cleaning lady just to, to sit there and, and, and to see him again and again and again. Uh, but I have a question to you. Why precisely Vysotsky? Is it any precise connection? Is it just why, because he was so important for Russia and Russian soul? Or is it a special connection between you and Vysotsky? I think a special connection between me and Vysotsky. Um, but not between just me and Vysotsky. I think he has a special connection. As Olga was saying, I think he has a, a powerful connection to humanity because I think he wrote, wrote songs that touched um, the meaning of life and the meaning of our struggles in life so deeply that I think it's not just relevant to the Soviet Union. Um, and I think it's become especially relevant now. I think we're living in very troubled times and he kind of gave meaning in struggle in difficult times to people across the spectrum and i think actually when i started learning about his songs the more i learn about his songs the more depth i find in them the more um substance and meaning i found in them. but as olga was just saying actually um the work the sign of a true artist is when people can read um, different, many different meanings into the same song, but it's not because they're misreading it, it's because all those meanings are, are there. And this is something that Anthony and I were talking about. Mm. I mean, in some ways, he's like Shakespeare, that you can interpret him and reinterpret him many, many times. Um, and yet, it, what's the interesting thing about Shakespeare is that Shakespeare over the generations has transcended cultures. He was, obviously he was an English writer writing in the 16th century. But I think, actually, I think um, Vysotsky has the power to do the same. And it's interesting what uh, Olga was also saying about how his, his phrases were, have been absorbed into Russian language. And this is the same with Shakespeare, actually. His phrases have been absorbed into English language. Um, and I think it's a, a measure of someone, of an artist who touches people deeply and makes something incredibly memorable. So yes, I, that, I have a very special connection. Um, and it's not something I was aware of when I started reading, but the more I've learned about him, the more, especially working in the translation, you have to get into the heart of, uh, of the writer. Um, and I've done that and working with um, Olga and with, with Anthony. So I don't know whether Anthony would also like to add something in res response to that, because I think Anthony's got in touch with him more as well. Well, uh, let me see, I will unmute. Yeah, just touch it once. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think my relationship with Vysotsky's work, um, as a singer and a musician, it's more of a physical relationship. I mean, of course, I read the words on the page and I read the poetry and and I enjoy it. And it does speak to me. But when you start to sing something, it's the body that sings and it's the body into which the music and the words enter. And that is really uh, I don't want to go on too long about this, but it's that's really 
what it's about to me. So the relationship is a physical one, not an intellectual one, or primarily physical rather than intellectual. Okay. Any more questions? Um, CM Strasfutje, Spasiba Gosoba. I hope you can hear me. I'm currently in a cafe uh, in, in Kazan, Russia. Uh -huh. um, Ruben, first, go ahead. Arusha, firstly, thank you very much for a very uh, interesting and, and dynamic um, lecture. Well, my, my, my question is about the relevance of Vysotsky in the post-Soviet space. So obviously the country in which he lived and um, was famous uh, no longer exists. We now have uh, Russia as, as a democracy. You know, um, it's still different to the West, but it, it, it is a democracy. Is he, is he still socially relevant? I think Olga very uh, concisely spoke on how he's linguistically relevant. He's clearly relevant as a, uh, you know, culturally, when you look at the history of the USSR, but is he socially relevant or has the system changed so much um, that he's no longer socially relevant? Thank you. Um, Olga, would you like to answer that or shall I? Uh, well, you are very welcome. I would just uh, say very quickly that uh, when I say that he's linguistically relevant, it, it, uh, it says it all because language is, first of all, the mirror of culture. And if people uh, refer to him and and uh, uh, quote him all the time and insert his expressions uh, in whatever they're talking about, then this speaks volumes and it answers your question. But, uh, you know, John, um, you go ahead, please. Well, I, of course, actually, if you can mute because I'm hearing myself twice. Oh, sorry, I, couldn't, I thought I was muted. Yeah, great. Okay. Thank you. Yes, um, of course. I'm not. I'm. I'm. A, I'm in the UK, so I. I'm. I'm speaking as an outsider. But I would say that actually he's even more relevant today. But not even more. He is deeply relevant today because the issues of life, the issues of oppression by authority, the issues of um, struggling for basic existence, that still affect all of us. I mean, there's. And what's interesting is, of course, is that actually his work wasn't just understood by Russians in Russia. His work was appreciated by all the, um, the, 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 the countries that were once part of the Soviet Union. Um, as I said to you earlier, I could have quoted that example from my cleaner, who was not, who was, um, well, actually her sister was not even born when Vysotsky died, but her, his work touches her and touches her family. And she's from, she's from Bulgaria, she's not from Russia. It touches her deeply. And I think it's because um, his work is universal. It's uh, the only reason why it's not been wide is that we've had this linguistic um, limitation, which has uh, was prevented it spreading um, beyond the Soviet, uh, uh, here, R Russian speaking countries. I mean, I know that um, for Russian people, Russian, speakers under 30, maybe he doesn't have the same resonance, but I think that's something that can be rediscovered. Uh, even if it's maybe lost, there's a, uh, uh, there is a time for rediscovering. There's a lot of things that have been lost in current day Russia, which may be rediscovered. Um, thank you. I'll just, I'll just add that um, it's uh, any true poet, any great poet will always be relevant. And again, going back to Shakespeare, is he socially relevant to England now, which, which has changed so, so much? Yes, he is, because it's because he touched the vital chord, uh, the existential vital chord, which everybody understands, and it's eternal. In the same way Vysotsky is eternal, in the same way Pushkin is eternal. And by the way, the first monument to Pushkin was uh, erected uh, almost half a century after his death. So, um, and this is to say that uh, the, uh, it's all in the future. And uh, Wysotsky is going to be discovered, rediscovered many, many times. And I have, I have never had any doubts, and I still don't, that uh, he is there forever, and he's here forever. Encore. I believe this. I believe the same. Having kind of. Uh, it's something that until I worked with the translations, I wasn't aware of. But now I have. It's it's I think it's 
one of the joys of working with translations is that you get to know someone's work and its meaning in a way that you don't necessarily, even by just reading. Um, and so I'm totally convinced of what you're saying, Olga. And thank you very much. But sorry, I don't know, didn't miss the name of the person in Kazan. Thank you. Ruben, Ruben. Thank you Our for listening. He's coming back eventually <laughs> to finish his uh, course with us. Um, I'm not sure if I will be coming back, Olga. It's, uh, or maybe he'll, yeah, maybe he'll stay in Russia forever. Exactly. Yes. Yes. It's it's such a powerful place after all. Um, uh, any more questions? Any more questions? Okay, well, if um, if not, then um, it remains to thank you profusely once again. It's been absolutely wonderful, amazing. And um, I sincerely hope, in fact, I am sure that uh, this um, collaboration will continue. Now, I do have one hand and it's my uh, colleague whom I introduced earlier to you, who is a professional musician herself, Yelena Artamonova. Yenachka, please. Uh, hello, uh, I'm not sure if my system is working. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, John, Anthony, uh, thank you so much for such a wonderful, heartfelt uh, performance presentation. Uh, it really comes from your heart and, and it's uh, it's uh, obvious to everyone. And it's very special and particularly when you uh, when you uh, are doing such a hard job of translating um, poetic texts not on, only into a different language, but also uh, managing uh, the texts with music. That's that's a double uh, task and you achieved uh, a, a wonderful results. So uh, well done. Thank you so much for uh, for joining us and uh, good luck with all your uh, work and activities, because this is a very important uh, step in um, in bringing uh, Vysotsky uh, texts, Vysotsky's art, uh, artistry, uh, to uh, wider audiences, in particular to English speaking uh, speaking audiences. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very, very much. So, unless there are last minute burning questions, we then draw to a close. And once again, huge thanks. And uh, I've been really touched by this. Um, uh, and it inspires, I'm sure it inspires many people and it definitely inspires us to continue um, and hopefully together to continue with this work of introducing Vysotsky uh, to the English speaking people, uh, to the English speaking you. world. Uh, Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. It's been such a pleasure and I'm glad we've been able to do this. Thank yeah. you very much, Olga. And, exactly. and to all the students and all those who've listened, it's been really appreciated. Anthony. Uh, so you can speak, you can speak, we'll be picked. Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, okay, well, just to say thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. And also, you know, it's been a, I, I really have to extend my thanks to John for helping me to discover Vysotsky, because I would never, ever have come across him if it hadn't been for that. And thank you. They're great songs. And it's a pleasure to sing them. I just hope that I've done them some little justice. Thank you. Definitely, definitely. A lot of justice. And thank you. Thank you ever so much. Uh, it's been great. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, everybody. Bye bye.